Well, good morning. Welcome to church. All those joining us online as well. We're going to stand. We're going to worship our great Creator, our Almighty God.
Psalm 18 says, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. God, we thank you that this is true, that you're a faithful God, that you are the rock on which we can stand. You're our place of refuge, that we can trust in you and your strength. Lord, when we've got nothing left, when we're exhausted, worn out, tired, we can come to you, great God, and you promise to meet us in that place in a personal way. And so we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be together, to worship you, to fix our eyes on you, Jesus, the author, perfecter of our faith, Lord, to encourage one another here this morning, to remind, be reminded again, Lord, of how good you are, how mighty, powerful you are. So we worship you in this place in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome. So good to have you here with us for our 10 o'clock service. Those joining us online as well. We have our family service happening right now over in the other auditorium as well. Uh, so that means that if you're here, the kids are staying in here with us uh, for this one. So, But there is an unsupervised crèche available for parents who want to make use of that. But we want to make sure everyone feels welcome. So turn to those around you. Welcome each other to our service today. Make sure you feel welcome to those joining us online. Carly is your host this morning as well. And uh, make, let us know where you're watching from so you feel welcome with us today as well. Great job, welcome each other. Make, make sure you stay around afterwards. If you're new to Bridgman, we wanna make sure you feel welcome and connected. Stay for our Connections Lounge afterwards. We'd love to help you introduce you to other people. We're not meant to do the journey alone, but be connected as a part of a family here. Also, I meant to mention with the other service over there, we've got our kids band over there leading, which is exciting to see the young people involved. And then tonight we have our switch service. We've got the high schoolers, our youth ministry leading the worship, and Mitch Peacock, who's our pastoral intern for kids and youth, is going to be sharing. And what I love is that we have a place here where young people, children and young people can grow up to know that they have a place in the kingdom of God, that God has a plan and a purpose for them. And I want to say thank you, Jerd, for making a space where kids and young people can come and be welcomed. As we often say here, we love the noises of children. We even love the mess that they make because they're such an important part of the kingdom of God. So um, come out tonight, encourage them. And we've got two dedications now, which we love as well. So can we welcome these crew here now? Awesome, that is fantastic. Actually, we have three dedications this morning. Um, and Sam and Ash have brought their little ones, Oliver and Ava, to be dedicated. And you're surrounded by family as well. So this is a real privilege for me, actually. Come forward a little bit so I don't feel too lonely up the front here. Uh, this is a real privilege for me, actually, to do this dedication. Uh, Sam and Ash have been a part of this church for many, many years and uh, played a significant role in my life, in my ministry as well, uh, when I was youth pastoring here at this church, both of them played huge roles in that, helping to oversee different age brackets and investing in that young generation, and there was much fruit in that as well. Then I got to marry them as a couple. My very first wedding I took, they took the risk, and uh, it, it, it was successful. Uh, it was cheap, that's for sure. And, uh, and now I get to dedicate their children, which is a massive, massive privilege for me as well. Um, Ava has a very special middle name and Ash uh, shared with me just a little bit about uh, that name as well. And so um, Ava's middle name is a combination of her late auntie, Jessica, and her late uh, cousin, uh, Giselle. And you put those two names together and it comes up with Giselle. And uh, sadly in 2021, they passed away. Um, but I think that is such a beautiful name, just sell the combination of those two names together. And just uh, uh, especially when you think of what her first name means, Ava means life. And, uh, and then there's another meaning behind the middle name as well, um, which God just has this amazing way in the midst of uh, sorrow and hardship as well, that he just brings a bit of a presence of his love and his faithfulness and uh, Giselle's 
uh, birth date was the 4th of January. And Jessica, Giselle's mother, um, your daughter, um, was born on the 6th of January. And you put those days together and you get the 10th of January, which is actually Ava's birth date. And I think that's, I don't know, for me, I just go, that's just God's way of just showing that he's, he's here, he's near as well. Ava's name means, means life. It's actually from the Hebrew word of Hava. And it, well, actually life or lively and hopefully not too lively for you guys. <laughs> I've got one and it's, uh, woo, but uh, life. And I think, that's a, I think that's beautiful. I think that's actually really powerful uh, because I, I think it shows that Ava is a gift of life to you as a family, as a couple, and for you as an extended uh, family um, as well. It actually uh, is a reminder, actually, and I believe this for Ava, is to be a reminder to you as a family and as a, 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 an extended family of God's uh, life-giving love. Um, that, that he is a God of love, grace, and he's actually a God of nearness um, as well. I love what John 14, 6 says, it says that Jesus says that I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. And I, I believe this for Ava, that as she comes to know Jesus uh, and the fullness of that, she'll actually be a set apart to be a life giver uh, to you as a couple. But I believe to many people, you know, that her name will be set apart in that as well. And so we want to pray that over her life, that she'll know the fullness. And I believe that out of that too, there'll be a, uh, people that interact with her actually know that um, of God's love and, and spiritual life that we come in Jesus and spiritual renewal. That's my prayer, that as people interact with her, they'll actually have spiritual renewal as she points people to the life giver, Jesus. And so that's my prayer for her. And then we've got Oliver Arden Lewis, and uh, they, he, also, he, he also has some uh, special names. Arden is a long-time middle name of the Valentine family, uh, which is really cool. And I don't know if you know this, but as I dug into the, the Hebrew word of it, it actually um, means Garden of Eden, which is, which is pretty amazing because uh, the, originally a garden that God had set up where he could dwell with his people. In the cool of the evening we read in Genesis that... Adam and Eve actually walked and conversed with God as a place of total provision um, as well. And then his uh, second middle name, Lewis, is from uh, your grandfather's side as well, Grandad Turnbull. And it actually means a renowned warrior from what I read. And uh, the Bible uses this crazy illustration of lion and the lamb. We just sung about it. And if you look at what the line means, it's Jesus Christ who'd come, God in human form, to actually defeat death, to actually bring spiritual life. And uh, as, as I, I look at Oliver's life, I, I pray that he will know that Jesus is for him. As we go back to the Garden of Eden, actually it, it tells us we turn our back on God. But God loved us so much that he came and sent Jesus to actually defeat death. You know what I mean? Almost like that warrior. But how he did it, it is like a lamb. He humbly bowed and humbly went to the cross for us. It wasn't in this big parade. It was a humble lamb. And Oliver's uh, first name actually is, comes from olive or olive tree. And uh, all through the Bible, um, the olive or the olive branch is a sign of peace. And actually when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane praying, just before he went to be on the cross, it was actually said that that was an olive grove. And, uh, and he came to bring peace that we could have a relationship with God. And I couldn't help but bring those three together and actually see that's Jesus' redemptive story. We, we were created to be in relationship with God. We turned our back on God. He came and died on a cross, defeated death, and came so we could have peace. And uh, my prayer for Oliver is actually very similar to Ava's, um, is that he would know with such truth of God's love for him and for his people and that it will impact his whole direction of his life that he'll actually be strong and courageous like a warrior in that in his leadership he'll lead with great strength and courage but also with great peace as well with humility and compassion and I think there's a theme between these two names that Jesus is here to remind you through these children that he's a God of life he's a God of love and he's uh, through these children that many people will actually come back to him. That's what I believe. And so um, we're going to pray about that in a minute. But I just want to say this. So Sam and Ash, 
Um, You've come to make a commitment. So let me ask you, in presenting Oliver and Ava to the Lord, do you acknowledge that they are actually a gift from God? And do you promise independence on God's grace and the partners of this church to teach them the truths of the Christian faith, to set an example for them in Christian discipleship, to pray for them regularly and encourage them to commit their life to Jesus? We do. Well, I'm going to let you, maybe I'll hold Ava. She's, she's very snuggly. <laughs> Ava, Giselle Valentine, and Oliver Arden Lewis Valentine. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord shine his face upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. We'll briefly pray for both these. Lord Jesus, I want to thank you for Sam and Ash. Lord, I want to thank you for Oliver. Lord, anoint him by by your Holy Spirit and for Ava as well. May they be set apart for you, for your purposes. May every person that comes in contact with them will know that they are set apart. People will see your love, your life, and your light. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we encourage this family as they go? Oh, man. Fantastic. We're getting ready for round two. While they're coming up, just a couple of things to let you know about that are coming up. A men's retreat is on next weekend, men. You need to register. Registration's closed tomorrow. Dave Jensen coming to share. Dave shared at our men's breakfast last year. Um, grew up in the in uh, we're having a faith. Actually, the son of the Archbishop of the Sydney Anglican Archbishop, Philip Jensen, went away from faith, had a career in the army. Pride himself on living a real blokey lifestyle until God got hold of his life and brought him back. So don't miss that. Make sure you register for that as well. Also, I want to let you know the Inspire services on this Wednesday. Carly Fashina is sharing there. And I think we're ready for round number two. Can we give this family a big welcome as they come now to be dedicated as well? Bless you, church. Another dedication. This is so exciting this morning. Come forward, family. We have Annalette's mum and dad here from South Africa. So we had to squeeze in a dedication before they went home today. Helgot and Tinka, welcome to have you here. And then other friends and family joining us online today. We so want to welcome you this morning. And Annalette and Marcus are so aware that you, church, are their family, supporting them on this journey. So I think we should give you a clap for being here and part of this this morning as well. We bring, they're bringing little m a to be baptised. <laughs> baptised. We'll baptise you one day. But today we'll just dedicate you <laughs> to be dedicated to the Lord this morning, thanking God for this precious gift, but also um, asking for God's wisdom and help on the journey too. So church, m a means faithful, truthful and trustworthy. What a beautiful name for this beautiful little one. Um, And they found out they were pregnant on Father's Day in 2022. And God gave them Psalm 100 as a beautiful affirmation of this little gift. One of my favorite Psalms too, I must say. So church, here it is. Shout to the Lord, all the earth. M&A, worship the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with singing and with joy. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us and we are His. We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Hear this church, give thanks to Him and praise His name. For the Lord is good. His unfailing love continues forever and His faithfulness continues to each generation. Thank you that M&A represents God's heart for you guys in those words and that she would carry that truth in her life forever and always. Annalena Marcus, in presenting M&A to the Lord, do you acknowledge that she is a gift from God? Do you promise independence on God's grace and the partnership of the church to surround her life with love, care and compassion, to teach her the truths of Jesus, to pray for her and to encourage her to commit her life to Him? 
That is awesome. Well, I would love to pray a blessing over M&A now. M&A Kruger, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up the light of His countenance upon you and give you His peace. Amen. Let's pray, church. Jesus, we thank you for life. We thank you for the gifts that you pour out upon us, God. For this beautiful reminder this morning of your faithfulness, your faithfulness through all generations. And Lord, we pray your blessing over this family this morning. We we thank you for life and just ask God that you would continue just to guide them on this parenting journey, to fill them with your wisdom, God, that they would know your voice as they raise this little one, God, and that we would be so aware, Lord, of your faithfulness and your goodness always through this little life, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, church. Can we give them one more welcome this morning? Thanks, Jody. Wow. We love being able to celebrate in those dedications. Just the last couple of things to mention. We have a prayer and healing service on today at 3 p.m. over in the chapel. If you have a need, we'd love to pray for them. Very moving services, full of God's love and presence. No matter how small or big you need, just the fact of coming is an act of faith to come and to be there this afternoon. And we've seen God do some amazing work through those prayer and healing services. Also wanted to mention on the 28th of April, we have a couple of baptisms already booked in on that day. So we're opening that day up again for any who would want to be baptized. Uh, across that day like we did at Easter there'll be opportunity as well on that day if you want to be baptized if you're not as comfortable sharing your testimony up front we can um, um, have an opportunity for you still to be baptized on that day as well and we'd love to help you with that so you can reach out to one of the pastors or email through the office and we can organize that for you and uh, also we have letters for the persecuted church today Robert and Aileen Byers are out in the courtyards there on both entrances we love doing this writing letters to bless those who are in prison for their faith around the world. And in fact, Robin and Aileen are about to head off too to Korea, do some mission work over there. And so we want to pray for them in just a moment as well. This week, we are launching our 10 Alpha courses, which is amazing. We're so excited about this church. We've got a little video clip we want to show you, which just gives you a little insight into what Alpha is about. One of the most powerful things we can do if we want a friend or a family member to come is actually to bring them with you to Alpha. Um, say, oh, we'll do the course together, put them at ease, makes them feel comfortable. But let's watch this little video that QB put together. It's from Jason and Alicia from our church. Give you a little insight into the power of Alpha and that journey. Thanks so much, team. <laughs> okay. Hi, my name's Alicia, and I've been participating in Alpha. So what brought me to signing up for Alpha was Jason, my husband, and I were new to the church. And we kept hearing about Alpha from the pastors as we, I guess, became more comfortable with coming to Bridgerton. Um, we decided that that was our next step on our faith journey to um, yeah, enroll in Alpha and see what it was all about because we did have questions around faith. I know um, I had my own. Um, uh, so just how we ended up here at Alpha. My name's Jason, and I've been participating in Alpha. Uh, I've been attending a number of services here at Bridgman Baptist Church, and throughout each of the, the, the Sunday sessions, Alpha often kept coming up, and I wasn't too sure about it. I wasn't quite sure about church, really, uh, and the whole religious side of things. So I made some time to touch base in with a couple of the pastors, and I asked about Alpha and what it was all about, and had a lot of questions, and their simple response was, maybe you should do Alpha and, and work that out for yourself. Uh, so I had a conversation with my wife, Alicia, and we both decided that it'd be really good to do the Alpha course and go from there. So initially, I did have some hesitations insofar as I was thinking, well, you know, I'm familiar with Jesus and, and God and Christianity, but maybe not so familiar with the Bible. 
as such. Um, so a hesitation for me was that, you know, I'd turn up and I'd be with other people that were, I guess, further along on their faith journey who knew, um, you know, more about Christianity. Maybe I'd be sort of sitting there thinking, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, so that was the hesitation, but um, yeah, I think after our first session, it was de definitely the way it was set out really was so inclusive. Well, on the first Sunday afternoon, I was quite nervous. I wasn't sure what to expect or what it was all going to be about. But when we arrived, there were people to greet us and, and welcome us to, to, to the afternoon. And we walked inside and there was a lovely banquet of food and, and some tables all set out. So. It really softened the experience. And I guess some of the nervousness came from, I know I had a lot of questions. I didn't know whether those questions were gonna be answered. I didn't know what the conversation was gonna be about. Um, we split ourselves up into little groups and listened to the first video and presented a couple of questions. And then the nerves started to dissolve away as we got into the group conversations and you worked out pretty quickly that you weren't alone on your individual journey and everyone sitting at the table had different experiences throughout their life and they were all there for different reasons and that became quite apparent quite quickly and made it much more comfortable to get involved in conversation and, and talk about different things. I guess for me it put a lot of things, like I've always believed in God and Jesus. And I guess it put a lot of things into context. The big takeaway for me was it has been understanding more about Christianity, understanding where the Bible sits in, in Christianity and, and scripture, and being able to have uh, authentic and honest conversations with other people about core elements of Christianity. And one of the big ones for me that I've taken away from it all is that God is always there talking to you. The question is, are you listening? And that's been a real big takeaway for me. Can we thank Jason and Alicia for sharing their story with us? Powerful story. A list of all those Alpha courses is in your news that are on online. We'd love to have lots of people being a part of that. That's all I need to mention. We're going to pray and we're going to hear from God's word in just a moment. So let's join our hearts together in prayer now. Lord, we want to thank you that this is who you are. You come to meet us personally to transform lives. And Lord, you care about us and all the details of our life, Lord. And so we want to lift up some in our church family at the moment. I'm going to pray for Nairi particularly and Murray. Bless them. Be so near at this time, we pray. For Mayor at the moment, Lord, we just continue to pray. For God, for the doctors, your healing touch there. For Bev, Lord, our sister in hospital there. For Amy as well. Gloria, Aileen. For those undergoing treatment for Owen. For Lorraine, Karen, Vicky, Lord, and others here I know this morning, Lord, who have loved ones who are very unwell at the moment and grieving, Lord, um, the loss of loved ones in their own family. And so, Lord, we just pray your nearness, your comfort. And, Lord, we want to keep praying too also for our community, our city, and our world, the great needs all around our world. We think of particularly some of the conflicts that are taking place. We pray again for the situation Eastern Europe there, for Ukraine and Russia, Lord, for peace to come there, for the Middle East, Lord, we pray again. Would your peace come, Lord, we pray to our world. Cry out again, Lord, intercede, pray to your merciful God. And Lord, as we open your word now, we just pray we'd hear from you, you'd speak to us by your Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, we are blessed to have Pastor Andrew bringing the second message in our series, The Miracles of Jesus in the Gospel of John. Would you make him feel really welcome as he comes to share now? Thanks, Nathan. <clears throat> thank you. It's um, a joy to be with you. I hope you had a great Easter. It was amazing um, to be here. And thanks for everyone involved in welcoming. And I know many people brought people, uh, friends um, to the Easter services. That was a, a real great time. It was so good to see God at work there. And as Nathan said, we're in a new series this morning in the second week, looking at the miracles of Jesus and particularly in the book of John. Now, John calls his uh, miracles like signs. They're like signposts pointing towards Jesus. And I want to read you um, John's distinct goal in writing the book of John. He says in John 20, 30 to 31, he says this, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples. These, these are just a few, he's saying. There's so many more. 
uh, which are not recorded in this, this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That's actually an invitation for us here today. That as we look at this word, as we look at who Jesus is, the, the whole idea is that in him, by believing in him, by putting our faith in him, we may have life in his name. And so today we're looking um, at the miracle of the healing of the, the, the Roman officials, or the royal officials' um, son. But as we look at these stories, we, we often realize that Despite Jesus doing the miracle, there's a greater story or a greater lesson that he's trying to teach us. So when we looked at, at, if you're here on Easter Sunday, we looked at the resurrection of Jesus. And in that, he, sorry, the resurrection of Jesus, yes, but he rose Lazarus from the dead. And in that miracle of rising Lazarus from the dead, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Yes, I'm doing this miracle, but I want you to understand something far greater than that. I am the resurrection and the life. And similarly in this story, yes, this son is healed, as we'll get to see in a moment, but he's teaching something far greater about faith. It's about faith. And so we're going to look at that today. And I want to take you very quick, quickly in the first four chapters, because we're looking at chapter four. In the first chapter, where we see this um, sort of theme in these first four pa- chapters, in the first chapter, Jesus is saying... John says, he says, I came to that which was his own. Jesus came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. So Jesus is saying, I came to my own people, but they did not receive me. In the second chapter, we read this story where he does all of these miracles at this festival, but the people were interested in the miracles, and it says Jesus didn't entrust himself to them. In the third chapter, we see one of the Jewish teachers, the Israelite teacher, Nicodemus, one of the top teachers. He comes in secret to Jesus and he says, I know you're a great teacher. We've seen you've done miracles. And Jesus speaks to him about the fullness of who he was. And Nicodemus couldn't accept it. He didn't receive it. He didn't, couldn't believe it or act upon it. And he went away disappointed. And then we get to this chapter four that we're in today. And there's this story of the Samaritan woman. You might be familiar with that. Jesus meets her and she says this. She says, and remember the Samaritans are despised by the Jews. They're looked down upon by the Jews. But she says this after talking to Jesus. says, I know the Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us, she says. And then Jesus declared, I am the one, I, I the one speaking to you am he. I, I am the Messiah. And she believed. She believed in who he was, not miracles. She didn't see any miracles. She just believed in what he said. And then it goes on to say she went out and told the whole village. And then in verse 41 it says, And because of his words, many more became believers. Because what Jesus spoke about himself, because who he said he was, many people put their faith in him. And they said to the woman in verse 42, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is the saviour of the world. So they had put their faith in him. And note that they didn't see any miracles. They just took him at his word. Now in, let's look at today's passage and we see a contrast here. It says in verse 44, this is the passage we'll look at today. It says, an interesting thing, it says, now Jesus himself had pointed out that a prophet has no honor in his own country. This is what I'm saying, that they didn't receive him. When he arrived in Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. They wanted to see the signs that he'd done. They had seen all that had been done in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, for they also had been there. Once more, he visited Cana in Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine And there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. Now that's 32 kilometers away from where they are at the moment. And when this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son, who was close to death. And then Jesus said this, Unless you people see signs and wonders, Jesus told them, you will never believe. 
The royal official said, Sir, come down before my child dies. Go, Jesus replied, your son will live. The man took Jesus at his word. Just remember that. He took Jesus at his word and departed. While he was still on the way, his servants met him with the news that his boy was living. When he inquired as to the time when his son got better, they said to him, yesterday at one in the afternoon, the fever left him. Then the father realized that this was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, your son will live. So he and the whole household believed. This was the second sign Jesus performed after coming from Judah to Galilee. What I want to look at in this passage is, as I said, faith. I want to define faith. You know, faith is one of these funny words. It's, it's in the Bible. We talk about it. But what is faith? Some people think, well, it's just positive thinking. You just sort of have faith and it'll come to be. But faith is like nebulous. I want to look at it. But what I want to look at, maybe more importantly, is how faith impacts our life. When we put faith in Jesus, it allows Jesus, it brings God's work into our life when we have faith. We open ourselves up to the activity of God in our lives through our faith. And I want to encourage us all here. No matter what you know about Jesus, I imagine in this room, there are some people who know lots and lots about Jesus, far more than myself. And there are others who know very little about Jesus. I want to say it's not so much about how much you know about Jesus. The important thing this morning is how much we are trusting Jesus to be who he said. It's not about knowing, it's about trusting. And that's what we, we learn in this passage. And we look at this in terms of the healing of the son, but the good news for us is we might not have a son that's nearly dying, but we have lots and lots of situations in our lives where we need Jesus to come and work in our lives and in our circumstances. So we can learn principles of faith that we can um, apply. Now I've asked two volunteers to come up, if I can ask Daniel and Jack to come up, and I wanna look practically at what faith is. This is a father and a son here, Daniel and Jack. Can we welcome them to the stage here? <laughs> Jack, if you come and just stand here, just face that way for me. Daniel, if you can stand behind him. Many of you have seen this before, but I wanna explain. This, this is the trust fall, right? So Jack, um, you've got your father behind you here. Daniel's getting very prepared, so that's good. He's prepared. Daniel, if, if Jack falls back and trusts you to catch him, will you catch him? Yes. He will. Yes, he said yes, he will catch. Now, Daniel, can you just tell me, how far away from Jack are you? About a meter. About a meter. Are you sure it's not three meters? <laughs> Jack, Jack got a bit nervous. Now, I said that for a reason. You'll understand, I'll bring it out later, but God promises us things, and there's an adversary that says, is that really true? Are you really gonna trust that? And what Jack did, and, and the person in the first service, they looked back and said, is it really true? Yes, he is one meter. They reassured him themselves by the truth. This is what I'm talking about. We trust and put our faith in truth, and we have to know the truth. And there's gonna be other things that are gonna say, is that really true? I don't feel like it's true, but it's the truth. So Jack, he's one meter apart, so he's okay, you're good. So Jack, could you just fall back into your father? Trust your dad to catch you. Good man, hey, yeah, thank you. Stay there for a moment. Practical illustration. Now, a lot of the things in the Bible or Christianity are not necessarily difficult to understand. It's difficult to apply into our lives. But here, some very simple things about faith. What is faith? The first thing I want to say about faith is it's in a person. It's in God. I'm just going to use Daniel as our illustration of God. It's not in positive thinking. It's actually in a person of God. So it's not like if, if, if um, Jack sits here and goes, I think he'll catch me, I think he'll ca catch me, um, and I hope he's there, I hope, 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 if I hope enough he'll be there, it's not like that. It's in him, not in his thinking, it's not his own faith, it's in the person, it's, he's, he's put his faith in the person of his dad or God. The second thing is, it's in a promise. 
Daniel said, Jack, yes, I will catch you. So Jack is putting his faith in the promise of what Daniel said. He's trusting him and saying he will keep his word. He will do what he said he will do. Remember that. He will do what he said he will do. That's a promise. And his faith is in God and his faith is in what God says he will do. The third thing is, it's an action step. Faith is an action. Faith can be seen. You just witnessed Jack's faith in his father. You witnessed it. You saw it. Now, Jack could stand here and say, I could ask Jack, Jack, do you think your dad's going to catch you? Yeah, I know he will. He's strong. He's good. He's not, right now, he is not exhibiting faith in his father. As much as he believes it, as much as he knows it, he's not exhibiting faith yet. When he exhibits faith is when the center of gravity gets outside of the base of support. I used to be a phys ed teacher. That's, that's uh, something I learned back at university. It came, came good as a pastor. That's nice. <laughs> There's a moment the center of gravity comes outside of the base of support and at that point he's got no, no control other than to fall. That is the moment faith is exhibited. It's an action. It's not him saying, yes, dad will catch me, yes, dad will catch me. That's not faith. That's knowledge. It's when that knowledge is acted upon that he exhibits faith and he falls into his dad. It's an action. Fourth thing I want to say about faith is it's a letting go of control. At that moment where center of gravity is outside of the base of support, he has no control. His dad is then acting. Not Jack. When Jack's in his dad's arms, Jack's not holding himself up. His dad is. When Jack's standing there, who's holding Jack up? He is. So faith is letting go of control. Daniel can't hold himself up and Jack at the same time. It's God holding him up. And that happens when he trusts him, when he puts his faith in him and has an action as a response to the knowledge that his father would hold him up. Do you understand? The last thing is, I just want to mention or admit to us all, it's difficult. It doesn't feel comfortable. You've probably done it yourself. I can ask Jack, what did it feel like when you were just about to fall? He's like, it's difficult. And you know, I've done this lots of times where people are like this and then they're like, because what they're doing is they're bringing their base. It's what, I'm not going to lose control in this. I, I don't really know if I can trust that person so I'm going to take control of this situation. I'm going to put my foot here and then I'm okay again. That's not faith. That's trusting in yourself to hold yourself up. It's difficult. It feels awkward or uncomfortable. But it's where God wants us to live. God wants us to live with our, the center of gravity outside of our base of support where we're trusting him. And if we can imagine... Daniel laying in his fa father's arms, holding him. How's he feeling right there? At rest and at peace. This is what I want to speak about today as we look at this passage. Can we thank Daniel and, and Jack for us? Thanks, mate. Good job. So let's have a look. I want to look at this passage now and look at how faith works in this situation. And we see in the royal official, his faith grows. And so the first thing is, um, I want to mention about faith in this situation. In the royal officials' faith was intentional and deliberate. So let's go back to the story. We've got this royal official who's got a son that's nearly dying. Now, at one point, he hears news, just a bit of knowledge, word, that Jesus, the miracle healer, is only 30 kilometers away. So he's heard that, he knows that. No faith yet, right? He's just sitting with it. Then he has a choice to make. And he says, I'm going. I'm going to leave my son who's nearly dying. I'm going to walk the 32 Ks or I'll get on my horse or whatever I've got and I'm going to get before Jesus because if he can heal, I want a part of it and I'm going to go and, and call him to come. Now that's an action He's got that knowledge and he's acted upon it and he's stepped and he's gone to get in front of Jesus. If Jesus is who he says he is, I want a part of it and I'm going to act upon it and my life will show it through my actions and I'm going to go. 
Now, we read this story in hindsight. We all know that he went and he got healed and all that. But he could have, and maybe there are other people in the same town who had sick people that heard, Jesus is in town, 32 kilometers away. But I'm not really sure if he can heal my son. Or that's a, it's a bit of a long way to go when he may or may not hear my son. So I'm just going to stay here and I'll spend these last hours with my son and just stay here. That's not faith. That's, that's them just staying there. Faith is an action. And he went. And also this, this man was a royal official. He humbled himself. I don't know if he begged too many people, this royal official. I don't think royal officials usually beg people for too much. But he humbled himself at, at, at a cost to, to those in front of him, maybe his own humility, like he, he, he just, his own pride, sorry, and he humbled himself. And my question to us this morning is simple, and you can apply it into your life, is what is a deliberate, intentional step of faith that you can take in your life circumstances? Not just believing that God can do this, or not just believing that this is who he is, but Acting out of that and making a conscious decision. And that could, could be anything for you. you. You just ask God what that might be. But I just heard one in this Alpha story. Jason and Alicia said we'd been to church and we'd heard a little bit about Jesus and a little bit about Alpha. We were nervous. We didn't know what to do. We didn't know what it would be like. But we took a step of faith. That is faith stepping. They didn't know much. But what they did know, they acted upon and took a step. And then later, that faith continued to grow. They've been baptized here. That is faith. It's when it's activated, when we step into things. And if you want to, maybe you want to know more about Jesus here, take the faith step to do Alpha. Maybe others of us here have got friends. I'd love my friend to do Alpha. Take the faith step to ask them to come to Alpha. Maybe you want to know more about, more about Jesus. You want, you want to experience more of Jesus. You, you want, if, he's, if he truly is who he says he is, I want to experience him. I don't want to just know about him. I want to experience him. So what is a faith step for you to say, well, Jesus, if this is who you are, I'm coming after you. What's a faith step? Not just staying still, but saying, oh, I'm going to find a mentor. I'm going to get into a Bible study group. I'm going to do something. But faith and trust. And it's an action. The second thing we realize in this story, as his faith grows, uh, he comes to Jesus, he asks for, for him to heal his son, and Jesus says this strange thing. He says, you'll only believe if you see miracles. He, but he says that you, not to the man, to the crowd. This is where he's, he's, he's pointing at for these guys. Says, like, you only believe if you see miracles. The story goes on, the man, doesn't even, that doesn't even fit his context. And he just says, I just want you to come before he dies. And then Jesus says, go, your son will live. And this is the clincher in this passage for me. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. Now, the man at this stage has not seen a miracle. He doesn't really know if his son has been healed. He can't just ring home and say, hey, hey, I just want to know, is my son healed? Jesus said he's been healed. He didn't have any of that. But he departed taking Jesus at his word. Do you see the faith there? It's like Jesus has said it, he's healed, well, I'm off. Good, done. <laughs> That's faith, taking Jesus at at his word and acting upon it in our lives. Now, in, in that, I want to just illustrate the posture of our heart when we are trusting in God. If you imagine that man coming to Jesus with the need of the child being sick, he's full of worry, anxiety, he's desperate, he's like, Jesus, please, that, that's where his heart is at. And then he departs, and he doesn't even race home. He goes home the next day, but he departs. Can you imagine? He's like, okay, Jesus, you said it's done. Going home. He's at rest. He's at peace. And he's expectant. If he's heard Jesus has said it, then will I expect to see it? And then he does later see that, but he's, he's at rest, he's confident, and he's expectant. 
because he's taking Jesus at his word. And I would say to us that there are two postures of our heart as we live our Christian life. One of confidence in God's word, expectation and rest in any moment in our lives or situations, or we're worried what's gonna happen in this situation. And, and our faith or lack of faith speaks. So what I mean by that is you can look at that man and you can see that he has faith because he took Jesus at his word and he just left. Let's say that this man had have said, well, Jesus, I know you've just said he's healed, but I'm not so sure about that. I would really like you to come with me. Let's go and let's make sure he's healed. He could have continued to beg and said, Jesus, I'm not going to leave you until I know that he's healed. I'm going to wait for the servant. And if you saw him act in this way, you would think of that man, well, you did not believe Jesus. Can you see how his actions would speak about his faith in Jesus? And it makes all the difference. I want to say to us this morning, this is the opportunity. In our life every day, in every circumstance, we have hundreds of opportunities to live by faith and live according to the promises of God. And it makes all the difference. Whether we just believe about Jesus and know about Jesus, or in any moment we are trusting in Jesus. It makes all the difference. Let me illustrate it by just a few quite well-known stories in the scriptures. The first one is David and Goliath. Most people are aware of the story of David and Goliath. So in David and Goliath, you've got this huge um, man, uh, Goliath, a giant, and he's taunting and intimidating the armies of Israel. And this little shepherd boy comes up, sees this situation, and says, what's going on? Why is that guy taunting us, and why is no one stepping up to the plate against this man? And David steps up against him, and you see giant, and you see David. Let me tell you, that is when his center of gravity is outside of his base of support. <laughs> He's like, unless you show up right now, God, I'm done. <laughs> but he said, and he said it clearly to Goliath, this is where my trust is, not in me. I come against you if the Lord of hosts, which means the army's angels, the, the Lord's army against you. That's where his trust is. And if you look at him, you could see, David, you're obviously trusting in something more than just yourself. <laughs> There's something else at play here. Your trust is in God. But my question this morning is, I don't know how many other soldiers were there of Israel's army, maybe hundreds. And if we went round and interviewed them and asked them, do you serve the living God? They'd say, yeah, we're the army of the living God. Do, do, do you believe God is big? Yeah, God is big. Do you believe that God is bigger than God? Yes, he's big then why are you not stepping in faith and why are you not in front of that giant? Do you see the difference between a knowledge of God and faith in God? It's not about how much we know. It's about how much we trust him in any moment. And when we trust him and we find that our center of gravity is outside the base of the support, we find God acting and not me acting in that moment. Interestingly, Saul says, go and may the Lord be with you, David. I'm, I read that, I'm like, Saul, why wouldn't the Lord be with you? <laughs> why are you not stepping up there? Similarly, if you look at the story of the promised land, I love that, it's called the promised land. God had promised them the land. Sends in 12 spies. 10 of them see giants and are filled with fear. Two of them see giants and feel God is big enough to do it. Ten filled with, with uh, fear, two filled with faith. They decided not to go into the promised land for fear of these giants. And they spent 40 years in the wilderness. And similarly for us, we have opportunities to apply our faith and live out of faith rather than Fear, to live on the promises of God rather than our own resources, day by day, an opportunity. And when we do, it's when we see the activity of God 
in our lives. So I want to look at this, how it works, and some practical examples for us. If Caleb, you can put up that little faith circle for us. A little illustration there. So this is simply what can happen in our life day by day. We have a truth of God's word. As I said, um, that's, that's not it, but that's the starting point, truth of God's word. And so when we read the Bible, the Bible is not a chore. The Bible is not necessarily just a discipline. The Bible is getting to know God, the one who we trust, and getting to know the thousands of promises of God that we can apply and stand on in our life every day. And as we do that, we enter into this personal relationship with God where he's involved in our life. And it's not just knowing about God, it's experiencing God. When the man trusted Jesus and he went back and then he heard that his son was healed, right then he experienced God because he trusted him. And so we look at this circle, we know God's truth, we know his promises, we stand on it and we act out of it, and as we act out of that truth in our daily circumstances, we find that God is faithful and he is true, and that just continues up into the truth, we know God's faithful, and he was faithful for that, and it continues to build our faith. David himself said, I beat the lion, I beat the bear, now Goliath, it built his faith. So day by day, we can know the promises of God and apply them in our lives. How, I'm always thinking, well, how does this actually work? So I have people, and I'm sure in a group like this, some people at various times in your life, you would like wisdom. I love this verse. This is a promise that I often share with people when they're asking for wisdom from James 1. And it, it illustrates a promise, but it also illustrates this faith aspect of well, as well. It says, if any of you lacks wisdom... You should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Do you see that there? That is the promise. You lack wisdom? Yep, I lack wisdom. Do I need wisdom? Yep, I need your wisdom. Well, you should ask God, and he gives it. I love that. He doesn't just give it. He gives it generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. That's the promise. But then it goes on, and it says, but when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Now, I wouldn't, that, that's from James. That seems harsh. <laughs> but this is what he's saying. He's saying if you, okay, your, your heavenly father, if you want wisdom, he's going to give it to you. He's going to give it generously, in fact. But what's, what's my part of the bargain in that? Don't doubt. Don't then go and think, well, is he going to give me wisdom? Am I going to know what to do? No. It's walking in confidence and in rest and expectation that, okay, God, you said you're going to give it to me. Then I'm listening and I'm ready for that wisdom. Confidence and expectation. And standing on it. Similarly, like a thing I think we all would struggle with is sin. And I think... This is one of the, the, the most important things in our Christian life is we will all sin, but what do we do with that sin? When I sin, what am I going to do with that? Now, the Bible says in Jesus, if we confess our sin, we will be cleansed from all unrighteousness. It says, if I sin, that I will not be condemned. So now when we sin... It's a little bit like this illustration here. When we sin, the Bible says you won't be condemned and you'll be cleansed from all unrighteousness. But you know and I know there's another voice in our mind that's saying, are you sure he'll forgive you this time? Shouldn't you be better than that? I don't think you deserve to go to church. You shouldn't go to church. You end up distancing yourself from God because of the feelings and the other voice. It's like saying to Jack, are you sure? Are you sure that he's only one meter? He might be three meters. Are you sure he forgives you? But in those moments, we then go to the truth, stand upon God's word. I know that as I confess my sin, I'm forgiven. I know that I'm not condemned. So what am I going to do? I'm going to take you up on that offer, Jesus, and I'm coming directly to the throne of grace. I'm coming directly to... um, 
into your presence because that's what you say about me and that's what you say I can do. So I'm going to act on that and not what I feel and not what this other voice is telling me. This is when you have freedom. This is when there's no condemnation. This is not when there's no wet blanket on us. Is because we take God at his word and we <clears throat> act according to that rather than what we feel, what we maybe see, or other voices we might hear. And there are hundreds and hundreds of promises of God that we could go through in that. But my final point here this morning is that our faith continues to grow. So there's this moment when the royal official goes back, as I said, confident and expectant. I only imagine when he sees his servant maybe running towards him and he runs towards him and he's like, is he okay? Did he, did he actually get healed? He's like, yes, he's been healed. And then he's like, well, when did it happen? He's like, at 1 p.m. Oh, wow, that's exactly when Jesus said it was. And so his faith now has become experiential and it, it, his faith is now built. And then next thing we hear is his whole family believes in God. So other people begin to see his faith. They, they, they get caught up in it. They can see faith. And I want to finish with a story here this morning of someone who is walking or, or has walked by faith. It's a tragic story, but a man who walked by faith. And the thing is that faith is not always seen in the miraculous and the healing. It's also seen in the tragedy. And in this story, it's a story of a, an NBA player, Monty Williams. He was an ex-player, he, he got injured, and then he became a coach, famous in America. And uh, he was married for 20 years. I think we can have a photo there of he and his wife, Ingrid, and they have five children. But his wife, Ingrid, was driving on a road, and on the oncoming traffic was a, a car... Uh, another lady was driving, and she was driving 150 kilometers an hour, and then she crossed the curb and hit Ingrid, and she died the next day. Now, Monty Williams was a Christian, and Monty Williams stood, and I want to share some of the words of his eulogy. And I'm actually really aware in this moment, I didn't know this, but the Turnbull family are here, and, and here I'll share the story that Monty Williams we can see his faith in this moment. And I honor the Turnbull family and say, we saw your faith when you had your tragedy as well. But Monty Williams stood and he shared these words in his eulogy. He said, from 1 John 4, 16, he says, God is love. Now think of the situation he's just experienced, the, the loss of his wife for 20 years. He said, God is love. And he went on to say, during times like this, it is easy to forget that, but God does love us. He loved me so much that he sent his one and only son to die for my, faith, for my sins. Do you, do you see this now? It doesn't look like God is love in this situation. I'm sure it didn't feel like it was love for this man. But he says, I'm standing on the word of God. I'm standing on what I know is true in this moment. He goes on to say in Romans 8, 28, he says, And we know that God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love God. And he said, all of this will work out. As hard as this is for me and my family and you, he said, I know this will work out. So he's saying, I know I can trust in the promises of God. I know I can trust in the character of God. And at the end of his speech, he says this, the family of the lady who killed my wife needs prayer also. He says, we have no Ill, Ill will toward that family. In my house we have a sign. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We cannot serve the Lord if we, are not, if we don't have a heart of forgiveness. So let's not lose sight of what is important. God will work this out. My wife is in heaven. God loves us. God is love. 
And when we walk away from this place, he says, let's celebrate because my wife is where we all need to be. He says, we did not lose her. When you lose something, you can't find it. I know exactly where my wife is, he said. So let's not lose sight of what is important. God is important. What Christ did on the cross is important. Let's keep what's important at the forefront. Thank you, was his words. This man was living by faith and not by sight or by feelings. He was living standing on the word of God. And I want to say to us this morning that when we stand on the word of God and live a life according to faith, when he stood there, there's no doubt that people saw there was something more in this story than the tragic circumstances, that God was there, that there was a strength and a hope in him. People saw God. As I said, we saw as as the Turnbull family shared about their faith in their moment as well. And Ernie Jackson, an NBA reporter, reported on this and said on national TV in America, he says, we all know Monty. And this is his words. He said, an ordinary man with extraordinary faith. And they said, that is what the world needs today. And I would say to us this morning, the same thing. Ordinary people, like you and me, with extraordinary faith is what the world needs to see. Would you pray with me? Lord, I wanna thank you for your presence right here, right now with us. That's the truth. We know it. I want to thank you for your Holy Spirit work, who works in our lives. And I believe your Holy Spirit who speaks to us. I want to thank you for your word, God, that's true, that it's solid. It's solid as a rock that we can stand upon. And this morning, I, I just feel if, if you can, it, it's been maybe your experience or you sense that maybe you've known a lot about God, but you haven't been trusting God or you want to trust God more, not just know about Him, not to have Him at a distance, but actually trust Him and know Him and know His work in your life and to live a life filled by faith that other people could see. I just, I just, just sense, like if that is you this morning, I just, eyes are closed here, just raise your hand and say, well, that's me. God, I might know lots about you, but I want to trust you. I want to involve you in my every bit of life. I want to take deliberate steps of faith. I want to experience you. I want to rest on you and and your capacity, not my capacity. If that's you, just raise your hand and I just want to pray for us all here today. Because I too believe, as that reporter said, the world needs to see people who are living by faith. They actually need to see God and not us. And if that's your prayer, just raise your hand. And I'm raising my hand too. Lord, you you see us and you know us and we're all at different stages of the journey. I'm very aware of that. Some may know very little about Jesus, but they can put faith in that little bit. It's not about how much we know, it's how much faith we have in you. And Lord, I just want to pray now that, Lord, you would show us and lead every individual by your Spirit here now as what steps of faith you are calling us to take, what areas of our life you're calling us to trust you and to let go ourselves, what areas of struggles we need to admit we need your help and say, God, I can't do it, I'm going to trust you. Whatever it is, I, I just thank you that you know everyone listening, those here, those online, you know us by name. Your Spirit is... Within us, your spirit is working. I want to pray, Lord, that you show us steps of faith. 
and that, Lord, you would give us the courage to live life with the centre of gravity outside of our base of support. That, Lord, we would live by faith and not by sight, not by feeling, we pray. And that, Lord, we would be known as people that take you at your word. Oh, God, help us, I pray. Thank you, God. Thank you for your word. Thank you for speaking to us today. Bless each one, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're going to sing a song about the promises of God and and let it be your heart's cry as we sing that out. That Yes, it's the promise of God. We're going to stand with you. We can be confident in Him and who He is. Let's do that together now. Let's continue to worship.
Lord, we thank you for your word to us this morning. Lord, I pray now you'd empower us by your Holy Spirit to be a people who live by faith, Lord. In our own lives, the little things, the big decisions, the big aspects of our life, Lord, and also for us corporately as your people, Lord, save us from falling into comfortable Christianity or comfortable church, Lord. We want to be a people who live by faith so that your power would be revealed, that we would know more of you at work, that you'd be lifted high, Lord, those God stories where people know only you could do it. We can share with generations to come that others look on and they are pointed to you. This is what we pray for, Lord. So help us, give us courage to keep living by faith, to keep stepping out. Uh, we pray so that we would see more of your glory revealed. Bless each one here today, I pray. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated if you'd like prayer. Our prayer team will be down the front and also our prayer lounge at the back. If you're new to Bridgman, head to our Connections Lounge. We'd love to connect with you there. Don't forget letters for the persecuted church and our prayer and healing service at 3 p.m. and switch service tonight. God bless.